Um, all right, got it. Um, and then of course, down here um, in power, we're talking about using hydrogen in a fuel cell to make electricity. Uh, again, for either mobility or commercial buildings, whatever. In industry, I think we look at hydrogen as a source of energy where we would burn it. But again, could look to fuel cell energy to make electricity, but there's combustion energy there we're looking at. And then similarly in buildings, is it used simply for combustion or is it used as, as a feedstock energy for fuel cells that, that are designed for buildings? So these are the kinds of applications. And, and then of course, hydrogen is a feedstock for chemicals. I alluded to this uh, earlier, we can make methanol, we can make ammonia, we can make many different things. Uh, with the hydrogen, we saturate carbon uh, molecules, we can make plastics, all kinds of things. So it's a very diverse um, product and can be used in many different ways in replacing our traditional energy sources. Today, hydrogen is a hundred billion dollar market. Most of it is industrial. So we're manufacturing hydrogen for oil refineries, oil sands upgraders, different ammonia and methanol production, those kinds of things. So it's heavy industry. Okay, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I McKinsey and company just released a new report uh, with the Hydrogen Council, July, 2021, last month, looking at hydrogen. And, and it was amazing how many new hydrogen projects had been announced even in the last six months. And so now they're predicting by 2030, it would be a 500 billion. So five, a multiplier of five times what it is today. Today, it's a hundred billion dollar industry. They're saying 2030, it'll be a 500 billion industry just based on what's been announced over the last whatever year and a half. So all of a sudden we're going from, well, is hydrogen really part of the energy transition to Wow, okay, there's actually quite a lot happening in this space now. Next slide, please. And uh, this shows the growth of announced projects uh, from 2020, uh, where McKinsey did their last report to even 2021 now. Uh, the thing is, is, is it pretty much exploding up to this $5 billion, uh, $500 billion plus um, scale. I think this little chart, the bar colors of the bars are meaningful because I, oh no, I guess it's just mature announced and, and mature announced. No, it, it actually is green hydrogen versus blue hydrogen versus something in between. And we're gonna get into this a little bit later. I, I forgot to touch on this when I was looking at those, car, those hydrogen molecules. Uh, if we go back to those hydrogen molecules, um, for a second, I'm just gonna talk about how do we manufacture hydrogen because I said, Hydrogen has to be manufactured and largely the way we manufacture them is, is from water. And basically you're stripping off those two hydrogen molecules off the oxygen molecule of water with electrolysis. So as long as we're using renewable energy, we can make hydrogen that is carbon free. And the byproduct in that case is oxygen, not a bad thing. And when we look over to the one on the right where we have a methane molecule, we can strip off those four hydrogens to make hydrogen off of a natural gas or a methane molecule, but we're left with a carbon molecule. And, and essentially there's two ways to do it. One is what we call steam methane reforming, where we're adding water in the form of steam and there's a chemical reaction, the hydrogens come off and the byproduct is CO2. So we're kind of back to square one. We got a CO2 problem to deal with. The good part of it is the CO2, con stream is concentrated and it's easily captured in the case of methane or steam methane reforming. And we did this at Scottford at, in the refinery at uh, Shell's upgrader in Edmonton. And we had a project called Quest. So we made hydrogen over there uh, using methane and we're stripping off all the hydrogen molecules, leaving CO2 as a gas. And then we captured the gas and we put it underground two kilometers deep into a uh, sedimentary rock. So we ended up with carbon-free hydrogen. That's the first way to make it from methane. The second way is called pyrolysis. And that's where we take that methane molecule and we have it in the presence, no presence of oxygen at high temperature. And we just strip off the hydrogens. And what we're left with is hydrogen 
with a byproduct of solid carbon waste, like a carbon dust. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the future because I, in the, this presentation, because I think it's an extremely important emerging technology that people aren't quite familiar with. And so it's not getting talked about a lot, but it is a game changer. It is a huge game changer for, um, for us in the case of uh, uh, a hydrocarbon abundant uh, country and one where we're building infrastructure for natural gas. And how do we repurpose that? Well, I'll get to that in a little later. Okay, so we'll skip forward again, Shanda. Uh, next slide, next slide, and the next slide. So hydrogen is a growing concern. Uh, and in China, China, of course, uh, within the last year has committed to net zero by 2060 and peaking carbon emissions in some key sectors before, by 2030. But quietly, as they announce these things, they are going about building large scale hydrogen projects. So this is definitely on their radar as well. Uh, massive hydrogen uh, projects, whether it's for industry or transport. But I think it, we'll talk about what are the true, what are the best uses of hydrogen in the energy transition in a minute here. So let's just go ahead, uh, Shanda, please. So this is, I got from a Bloomberg report in 2020, but it talks about the marginal abatement cost curve of using hydrogen to um, either abate or um, displace other CO2 emissions. So you can see that the transport element is actually uh, some of the lowest cost use of that hydrogen, cars, buses, trucks, heavy transport. I personally believe the uh, a rail is another one and aviation should be on there. But um, the, of these, uses for hydrogen cars, I think it's gonna have a lot of competition with electric vehicles. I think electric vehicles are gonna sort of take the foothold of, the, um, of displacing the fossil fired engines of the internal combustion engine, but the buses and trucks and heavy transport is a different scenario because the battery technology isn't sufficient to give them enough power for those big heavy vehicles. And so that's where this whole idea of a fuel cell electric drivetrain comes in for buses, trucks, and trains, et cetera. And hydrogen is the fuel uh, of choice there for that. So it's the low cost one. I see it coming there. Uh, also in some of these heavy industries, the oil refining and the steel and the cement are uh, applications. Some are in direct combustion and some are uh, uh, I would say those are probably direct combustion. And then we move up the, as we go up the food chain, gas to power generation is probably some fuel cell electric uh, type technology and methanol, uh, I'm not sure how it goes, but it, it's, I think the ones on the left are the more likely um, applications for hydrogen in the near term, call it 2030 timeframe. Next slide, please. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Rob, just why is shipping so much more expensive than, you know, trucks and trains and buses? I honestly don't know. I haven't, this is a 2018 study, but, you know, one would think that fuel cell electrics could work in shipping and uh, therefore that they could either store the fuel as methanol or ammonia or liquid hydrogen but I, I honestly don't know why that's so expensive. I would have expected it to be way down there with oil refining. So I'd have to, I'd have to dig deeper into the study to understand that one, Alex. I have some experience with this, but basically the uh, shipping, there's a lot more you have to do to, it, to shoehorn it into a ship. There's no spare space on there. Plus it has a much higher level of certification, uh, class certification. And, the, uh, when you're going along this, if you're, uh, there isn't uh, a lot of fuel cells that can use ammonia yet or methanol, and it's expensive to reform it. And uh, there's uh, those sorts of issues. A lot, and liquid, liquid uh, storing, uh, uh, storing of liquid hydrogen on board a ship is also fairly pretty expensive because you have to store a large volume of it um, and then keep it from boiling off. And it's not, it's entirely, technically feasible now, 
but it is expensive on a ship. That's yeah, yeah. Thanks, Al, for that, Alan. I think that's great. And one of the other things I might add that I believe that this study, if I go digging in there, what I'll find is that they've taken uh, water and they've electrolyzed it using renewable energy. So they've assumed we need renewable energy to electrolyze water to hydrogen. And then we're going to take that hydrogen and shoebox it onto a ship, like Alan has suggested. And then we're going to run it through fuel cells in the ship. So that's why it's so high cost. But as you see later in this presentation, you're, you're going to see that there are cheaper ways to manufacture low carbon and even zero carbon hydrogen than purely by electrolysis of water. And so that's probably, that has not been taken into consideration here. Because this is a 2018 a chart. Yeah, so it's three years old. Everything's moving pretty quickly in our energy transition right now, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, this is just a pictorial showing the energy system that all the transport is across the top, ships, cars, trucks, uh, planes, and they should show rail, but I think rail is a heavy transport. And most of that's, it's either diesel or um, some kind of marine bunker or um, other specialty fuels for these types of transport. You don't see any hydrogen in there. And then on the bottom is um, residential, commercial buildings and industry. And I think you'll see in the next chart and you'll see the little blue flame on the side. There's a little, little color code thing, but really there's no hydrogen in any of these uh, applications. And so the next chart is, this is a shell scenario of 2050. It shows where the hydrogen pops up. Um, and then the middle stuff is where does the energy come from? But if you flip to the next chart, uh, you'll see the blue flames coming in and forming a portion of the marine fuel, a portion of light vehicles, a portion of trucking, a portion of aviation. That's likely where it's going to end up in the transport sector. I would say more so in the heavy transport, like the trucks and possibly ships. Uh, and then down below, we'll see it in industry, uh, whether it's the steel or cement or others. And I believe with the right technology, we would see it in commercial buildings. And so the idea there would be you could have a very large fuel cell um, facility in a commercial building, and you could run the whole building on one fuel cell uh, with uh, some kind of um, hydrogen or hydrogen-based uh, fuel. So we'll see that, but it all always depends on how much renewable energy is available on a country's grid and are they looking for alternatives? So uh, in the case of Canada, we have, we're blessed with so much renewables that we might not turn to hydrogen or hydrogen fuels for uh, commercial buildings or building heat uh, or, elect or lighting. So, but anyways, that, that'll all tell in, in time. Next slide, please. So back to the manufacturing of hydrogen. So uh, this is a chart from the, the Zen report, which was a report for the British Columbia government, just as an input to their hydrogen strategy. And essentially we have, uh, hydrogen can be made as a byproduct of as industrial gases, that's the top the top one, but that's only occurring in fairly small volumes, to be honest. Um, ethylene crackers, for example, that are used for the manufacture of plastics, spin off hydrogen as a byproduct. And in Scottford at our Scottford upgrader, where we're upgrading heavy oil, we actually made a deal with those guys to buy their surplus hydrogen and built a pipeline over to Scottford and used it for the cracking. But I'd say that's not so much where we're headed in the future because it's small volumes. It's really about manufacturing it through electrolysis. That's the big box, gray box in the middle or purification with steam methane reforming and carbon capture or at the very bottom, this business of pyrolysis, thermal or plasma pyrolysis. And um, so if we're doing it with steam methane reforming and and pyrolysis, we're using natural gas predominantly to make the uh, hydrogen. And we have to deal with the carbon, either it's CO2 as a byproduct or pure carbon as a byproduct. That's called blue hydrogen. And then the green hydrogen is where you make it from water and you use renewable energy. 
and we have no byproducts other than oxygen. Next slide, please. So this chart was also from the Zen report and it showed the costs, the relative costs of manufacturing hydrogen and green hydrogen is the green bar third from the right, which is electrolysis of water using renewable energy. The blue bar right in the middle is making hydrogen from natural gas with steam methane reforming plus carbon capture and storage. And then second from the left, is the, what they call the SMR baseline, which is making hydrogen from natural gas, but just emitting the CO2 into the atmosphere, not capturing it. So that's the lowest cost. That's pretty much the way it's manufactured today in industry. Um, but I wanted to point out that there's emerging technology called thermal pyrolysis. And there are three different companies that I know of that are in different states of commercialization of manufacturing of hydrogen from natural gas um, so we're, and with no carbon uh, emissions to the atmosphere. The carbon ends up as a little dust pile or a large dust pile, depending on the scale of the facility as the byproduct. So it ends up as a solid waste, which could be either used for other products, call it carbon fibers, rubbers, uh, asphalt, anodes, cathodes, whatever. But there's this technology is coming and I think it's, it's a bit of a game changer in this hydrogen um, um, lens. And so I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into that. We can also see that the cost of this technology is even less than the natural gas with the carbon capture and storage and significantly less than the electrolysis. However, I guess I'd like to point out that doesn't make it better for everyone because I believe that this, this cost this cost basis is based on the cost of BC gas. This is the BC Zen report. So they're looking at our gas, which is $2 gas coming out of the Montney, which is the cheapest gas in the world. And they're applying that to this technology and saying, wow, look how cheap we can make hydrogen. But of course, if you're to take that same technology and put it in Europe where gas is $6, all of a sudden it's not so cheap. So it depends on where that gas is. Um, and I just want to make the, sure that I wasn't biasing this thing to uh, a choice for everyone because it's not. Uh, next also, slide. Also, Rob, I saw with uh, G Global Research a few years back, they produced a, an injection molded electrolyzer that could produce hydrogen for about the same price as gasoline at the time. That was probably 15 years ago. And they just shelved it because they didn't think they'd sell enough of it. So there are a lot of those sorts of technologies, we think electrolysis is kind of, you know, it's reached state of the art. It's not going to go any further, but there are other ones in the pipe that now with hydrogen economy kind of coming to the fore, they're going to now uncover them and uh, move them forward. So the thermal pyrolysis certainly is a really uh, good alternative. And I think that's coming on strong, but the, I know that there's other technologies out there that make hydrogen like electrolysis that can do it very cost effectively. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. I was doing some research on uh, on hydrogen pyrolysis technology, and of course, it's the electrolyzers, um, and they make them in ten megawatt scale, basically. They're ten megawatt blocks, and uh, there's a, a number of companies out there that are trying to reduce the cost by 30 40 percent over the next five years, even. So, we're going to see the cost of this green bar come down. The question is how quickly and um, and uh, that that will be important. The uh, That's the electrolyzer cost, cost of the electrolyzer. But the critical input is always the cost of the input of the electricity as well, right? How much does that cost? So there's the two elements. To make that hydrogen from renewable energy, it's the cost of the renewable energy and the cost of the electrolyzer that's that's, that's why that green bar is so high right now, but we're going to see both those things come down over time. So we're going to see this green bar come down for sure. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, and then the other interesting part of this is the carbon intensity. So steam methane reforming, if you're just making hydrogen from natural gas, it's, it's, it's the bar on the left. You have the 11 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. 
if if you add steam methane reforming, you you knock it down about eighty percent because you don't get all the you don't capture all the CO two, and there's some energy to, to that goes with the capture process. But you get it down about eighty percent if you're in green energy, which is the electrolysis process. As it's the second one from the right. It's zero carbon uh, or near zero. It would be just the cost of the materials to build. Um, the facilities, but generally when you're running, it's a zero carbon uh, operating footprint. And this technology called pyrolysis, there's a company called Monolith, which is now building, they've built their demonstration scale project and now they're expanding it to a commercial scale project. And this is the carbon footprint of manufacturing hydrogen from natural gas using pyrolysis. It's very small. And they were talking about making it go zero or negative by adding a small amount of renewable natural gas to the traditional fossil fuel gas. So if you blended, call it 10% of the feedstock gas with renewable, you could get it to zero or negative carbon because you'd be using essentially a fuel that's already pulled carbon out of the air. So uh, the next slide, please. And then I had a couple slides. Oh yeah, so this one, and then the other interesting thing about these three technologies, you need to consider not only the cost, not only the um, carbon footprint or carbon intensity, but the energy input. And so in terms of reforming, which is the top one, which is natural gas um, with steam methane reforming, you end up with a fairly high footprint. So you have to deal with that 8.85 by capturing the CO2. But that technology uses fairly low energy inputs to manufacture it. So it's fairly efficient. And that's what all the industrial guys are using today. If we skip over to water electrolysis, we have a fabulous carbon footprint improvement, but it's a significant amount of electricity you got to pull from the grid. And so, you know, we're talking about for a large scale a hydrogen power plant to feed a methanol facility, which would be, I would call it a small world scale methanol facility. We would need a hundred megawatts of renewable power kind of thing. So it's just got a significant energy demand to do it through electrolysis. And then we look at methane pyrolysis. It's kind of the best of both worlds. We can get a very low or minimal carbon footprint and we don't have a massive energy input. Uh, the gas itself does the job. Next slide, please. So that's where this company Monolith is headed with their uh, pyrolysis technology. They're using, re they're using a mix of natural gas and renewable natural gas so they can actually go carbon negative, but uh, even just using natural gas, you're at uh, almost, almost zero carbon footprint renewable energy to run the facility. And then what you produce is hydrogen and then a solid carbon waste. The solid carbon waste is about a uh, three to one. Um, so for every one ton of hydrogen you produce, you're producing three tons of carbon, which kind of makes sense when you think back to those molecules. We have four hydrogen molecules around the one carbon molecule. The solid carbon, gets turned into, in the case of the monolith technology, they're, they're turning it into a product called carbon black. Now, carbon black should not be confused with just a pile of black carbon soot. It's actually a manufactured product that can be used for the manufacture of rubber, tires, uh, and cathodes, anodes, whatever, for um, electrolysis industry. So it becomes actually a pretty usable or valuable product. The carbon. Next slide, please. Uh, the monolith guys have their plant up and running uh, in, um, I think I'm trying to remember exactly what's Nebraska, Nebraska, USA, and it's a 5,000 tons per annum hydrogen facility. Uh, and you'll see in the next slide, they're, they're, it's running and proven technology and they're gonna expand it times 12, basically. So they're gonna uh, take it up to uh, 12 times and uh, 
they'll be taking that financial decision this year. And I think the idea is they would use this hydrogen to manufacture ammonia. So it's linked to a, what I call a green ammonia or a renewable ammonia um, project. Um, next slide. So yeah, this is just a little comparison table of cost versus CO2 versus technology readiness, but the pyrolysis technology for, what shall we, shall I say, industrial applications, I think is commercially there. And now they're expanding it. Um, it's, it's cost effective in terms of uh, competing with uh, steam methane reforming almost, even cheaper, they're saying. Um, and of course, we, we just talked about the carbon footprint being almost equivalent to the electrolysis. And, and yet um, the energy inputs are very low for pyrolysis and the, and the technology is moving to uh, commercial scale now. Next slide, please. Um, why is all of this, I guess, important for us? I think we had talked always about you know, perhaps the LNG industry, we're moving LNG to China or wherever, and it's displacing coal. Um, and then the question is, you know, would we try and repurpose this infrastructure for hydrogen um, at some point? Meaning would, would we be converting our ships to hydrogen carriers? Would we be converting our pipelines to hydrogen? And I think the answer for that is sort of, you have to look into this transportation issue of hydrogen. What we know is that hydrogen, it's not easily transported, that essentially it is, it is less energy dense than liquefied natural gas. So if you look at liquefied natural gas out there, it's got this energy content per unit volume of 0.75. I've forgotten what the, uh, what the energy units are, but, uh, it's a relative scale, so liquid hydrogen. So if you, if you produce hydrogen and liquefy it and put it on a ship, basically all that to say on that same ship, you would only have one third as much energy if it was liquid hydrogen versus liquid LNG. So that's an issue um, that it becomes fairly inefficient. You would need three, more, three times more ships just to transport the same amount of energy as hydrogen. Uh, versus LNG. So that's an important fact factor. And then the same thing goes into the pipelines that you think about that 48 inch pipeline coming down. Well, if it was all hydrogen and it's compressed over here versus compressed natural gas, you have the same issue that it's, in fact, I think these ones, it's, it's even, no, it's about the same, roughly a three times uh, less energy dense and so you can only put one third the amount of energy down that pipeline now. So uh, becoming fairly inefficient. And that's not taking into consideration all the metallurgical issues that, that you run into uh, by trying to put hydrogen into a pipeline that's been built for gas. So that's a whole other um, storyline. But there is quite a, quite a challenge for transporting hydrogen. So some of these strategies are kind of concluding that the best strategy for hydrogen is produce it where you need it. And so if it's industry, produce it in a large industrial hub. If it's for transportation, produce it at the hub that's producing all the fuels for the transportation or the fueling stations, uh, those sorts of things. So we need to think about it in that perspective rather than, because everybody's talking, Australia is talking about manufacturing hydrogen and shipping it all around the world. But I think, when, when you look at this, the amount of energy that it, you need and, and ships and whatnot to transport it, you'd say, well, why wouldn't you just transport it as LNG, okay, to China and, and let them reform it to hydrogen, either using um, this new uh, pyrolysis technology and manufacture the hydrogen right where they need it in their hub or even the conventional steam methane reforming if they can do carbon capture and geological sequestration. So I think that's the next slide. So it kind of brings me to the point that LNG is three times greater energy density. And essentially it's about hydrogen is about how getting those molecules. We know China's market for hydrogen is growing, but, but do you ship them 
hydrogen as hydrogen or do you ship them the molecules that they can convert to hydrogen in the most efficient ways? And my, my conclusion is you ship them LNG and we, we build here in Canada an LNG infrastructure from right from wells to water that is net zero carbon as the goal of FNCI has pointed out. And then they take that LNG when they achieve it at their country and they convert it to hydrogen again in a net zero with net zero technology, call it pyrolysis or uh, steam methane reforming with CCS if the geology allows them to do it that way. So, and that, that is a, a much more efficient way to move hydrogen molecules around the world. Now, they're also looking at moving them as liquid methanol or liquid ammonia. So those are two other ways, but again, the same idea is you're getting a much more efficient way of moving the hydrogen molecules rather than moving them as uh, liquid hydrogen pure. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the last two slides, I kind of paint this. Uh, these were in my last presentation. I apologize for repeating them there, but essentially they're a, a bit of a vision on how things might unfold on with respect to hydrogen um, and, and the LNG sector. So we talk about China being the world's largest energy consumer in the future, and they're importing not only LNG, but other natural resources from Canada uh, because we are low carbon, uh, low carbon producers of these natural resources. So we've carved our position out as a low, low carbon supplier of um, high value, high value uh, natural resources. Uh, and then on our side of the coin, our, we've got a carbon neutral grid. We've almost, we're almost there actually today. We're between our hydro renewables and nuclear. I think we're at about 80% 80, 80 plus uh, carbon neutral. Um, and uh, we have about 20% less to go. That's not in BC. That tends to be in, in other provinces, Alberta, Saskatchewan in particular. Um, but hydrogen, in, we know that hydrogen is not a silver bullet for everything. It's got its role in heavy transport and in heavy industry and possibly commercial buildings. But uh, the, the thinking is it could be up to 25% of our energy needs. And that may be the optimistic view. Maybe the low side might be 15. Let's call it 15 to 25%. And we need a mix of this green, which is hydrogen from electrolysis and blue hydrogen, depending on the location. I see that that's how it'll evolve in Canada, that we, there's some places it doesn't make sense to make it from gas because there's no, uh, either the infrastructure for gas isn't right or the subsurface isn't there. Um, so we end up a mix. We have local hubs for hydrogen and we have uh, local uh, pipelines for hydrogen. We don't have long-term, we don't have large distribution. I think we would use probably our gas for any long range distribution of hydrogen molecules, we continue to use our gas infrastructure. And then we change it to hydrogen where it's needed. Um, that's the last point there. And then BC is a global leader and export of our low uh, CO2 natural resources. I think I meant that, made that point at the beginning. Next slide, please. Um, when it comes back to our Northwest coast um, and looking at Prince Rupert and Kitimat, the thinking is that we continue to use the infrastructure that we built, the natural gas and LNG exporting, and that it's still a fit with the, uh, the future, uh, with the energy transition. Whether we're shipping LNG for simply for gas in other countries or the, the other countries are now converting it to hydrogen, um, uh, we can still make the whole value chain net zero with the, with the pyrolysis and other technologies, the CCS technology. Uh, and then the other side of that is that the ports are equipped with hydrogen manufacturing and we're starting to get in and we could, um, we could make hydrogen fuel for ships, rail and heavy transport right in those, they become hydrogen hubs, the ports where the LNG ports. Uh, the BC transport, um, we could use the hydrogen for fuel cell electrics. So again, the ports become hydrogen hubs, just as well as some of the other locations across the country would have hydrogen hubs. We see one evolving in Alberta uh, around Edmonton. So that, and I could see one even potentially in central BC, whether it's Prince George or towards the Montney where we have subsurface uh, uh, ability to sequester CO2 and we have large industrial sources that we could actually capture 
CO2. BC industry, um, we talk about green hydrogen and local pipeline distributions. Um, and then this whole business of future fuels. So the whole idea of actually manufacturing fuels from captured CO2 and renewable hydrogen is, is something of the future as well. So we can make fuels because some, some elements of transport are gonna still need fuels, whether it's aviation, for example. And so if, they, if you can manufacture fuel that's net zero carbon, how do you do that? You do it with hydrogen and you do it with captured CO2. Um, and BC buildings, this isn't to rule out the possibility of this pyrolysis technology uh, being used in smaller, just as the small modular reactors discussion we had this morning. So I think as the pyrolysis technology evolves, there's the possibility of using these small pyrolysis reactors or facilities and having them in commercial buildings. And so where you have natural gas coming into those buildings, instead of burning that gas and having the emissions, you would convert it to hydrogen uh, through some kind of a reformate process or pyrolysis process, and then use it in fuel cell electrics and create the electricity for the whole building from the gas. And I think you would, you would do that if you, need to, if you need to create some space for electrics, because we, we talk about electricity, renewable electricity being the answer, and I think it is, but at some point, as we put more and more and more load on the grid and everything is electric, we need to start diversifying where that electricity will come from. So I think the whole idea that we could use small scale pyrolysis of natural gas for uh, creating hydrogen, and then creating fuel cell electric hydrogen uh, is, is something of the future as well. So that's not so much on people's radar. Anyways, that's my presentation. <laughs> it's meant to mostly stimulate some uh, thought and discussion and I'd sure be happy to uh, open, open it up for, for some discussion and questions. I was just going to say, Rob, that I think the pyrolysis, we looked at that one company in the U.S., but it's going mainstream to BASF has a test uh, system in Germany that is producing uh, about the same volumes. And they take it from the bench. They're now they completed it in April, I think. And they're going to run that for a few years. And then they're going to scale it up to full scale uh, commercial. So uh, it's not just one company. It's a pretty major company, BASF, has said, this is a thing and we're going to chase it. Yeah, the BASF was using the plasma technology. Yeah, yeah. And they're, they're chasing this hard right now. Yeah, and, and I, I believe Linde out of Munich, Germany has just announced some investment into hydrogen too, as they've been in the gas market for a long time. Just one question, Rob, um, because you said, you know, you could see a hub in, you know, Prince Rupert or, or Kitimat, where you have a local hydrogen facility to fuel into the transportation infrastructure. Could you see one hub in the middle of it that distributes it out to the two ports? So you only have one capital investment rather than two? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that yet. I think, you know, I think it links to renewable methanol, renewable ammonia. What we might find is there becomes a market for that internationally. It's not just hydrogen. If we could, if we can, if we could market renewable ammonia and renewable methanol, that those become valuable products to ship out of those out of those um, ports. And then, so then the question is, I know the uh, Prince Rupert facility does have methanol as part of their, um, as part of their scope, but so, yeah, I don't know exactly how the hub would develop. I think there's still too many unanswered questions, but I, all to say there is an opportunity there and uh, it would be a very, I'm pretty convinced that something that we can actually take advantage of that opportunity and make something happen there over time. So uh, Rob and others that are knowledgeable about this, if we were to reach out and try and invite some of the companies that are involved in production, um, any suggestions on which ones would be most likely to be interested in participating? Well, I think Alan mentioned BASF. 
I, I, I've seen quite a number of presentations, so I'm sure they would be more than happy to give you an update on their technology, how it's evolving. Uh, it's plasma pyrolysis technology. And then the, the other uh, company that I mentioned in my presentation um, is using thermal pyrolysis technology and they've built their first commercial scale and now they're expanding it. I'm pretty sure they'd be more than happy to, um, to present to you as well. Um, I'm trying to think if there was another company uh, that might be, if you, if you shift from purely pyrolysis to then what, what I call E-methanol or E-ammonia, which means it's renewable ammonia or renewable methanol using hydrogen from electrolysis or pyrolysis. Um, I don't know. There's a few companies out there that are in that game as well, but uh, you're starting to get further down that value chain, I think, uh, with those kinds of companies. I could do a little more research if you'd like and maybe come forward with some company names if you'd like. That'd be great. The extent Go ahead. Alan? I was just going to say that and it depends on what how you want to look at this. We can look at it from different angles because uh, I know Maersk, the biggest uh, container shipping company on the planet, are trying to move. They've stated they want to go net zero by, I think it's 2035. Um, and they've got a lot of ships with a lot of diesel engines. And they already have batteries on the uh, Maersk Cape Town uh, that is uh, running there. They've got their main propulsion that is an engine. Then they've got gas. They've got a bunch of turbines that run uh, generate electricity for shipboard stuff, like uh, uh, providing electricity to containers. And they're using the batteries in that to make it more efficient. So, from a, a potential customer to, for the ports and somebody who is interested in renewable methanol, renewable ammonia, running in those in the engines. And a big company who's very progressive, that'd be people to talk to. Uh, I think Shell are really at the forefront of this. Uh, I talked to some senior people at Shell and they said every single executive in Shell worldwide, part of their performance uh, pay is based on CO2 reduction. So if you're running accounts receivable, your part of your performance comes on how did you reduce your CO2 footprint? let alone the big refineries and ships and chartering ships and all of that. Uh, and they're driving that with offshore supply vessels for the big platforms, oil and gas platforms. They're saying, we're only gonna charter from you if you have a hybrid ship. So uh, those sorts of people talking to them, they're very forward thinking. And with uh, Zoom and uh, Teams, you can have some very uh, good and robust conversations with them prior to having a broader conversation and talk to them about what do they see in terms of their participation in, in something like this. So uh, I think that those would be really good steps forward uh, for kind of taking end users. Uh, and uh, I guess that's it. Yeah, and Santiago here just to expand on what Alan's saying on, on the on the demand side, uh, Japan and, and South Korea uh, at the government level, they have expressed uh, uh, a firm commitment towards uh, energy transition and particularly looking at uh, imports of hydrogen and ammonia uh, with low carbon intensity. So, so companies from, from, from Japanese companies to South Korean companies like the, the majors will also very likely be very interested in, in potential opportunities for, for uh, on, on how uh, both, both on the technology side, but also on potentially on, on, on being the off takers of, of uh, potential ammonia or hydrogen production. I think that's an excellent point. I know Mitsubishi is doing a lot on yeah. this. They're doing big mining trucks with uh, uh, fuel cells. Um, yeah. And also the Japanese government have an export development company called uh, Japan Banker International Cooperation, mm -hmm. JBIC, and they finance yeah. billion dollar projects anywhere in the world if they uh, use Japanese technology and Japanese companies. And I know for a fact that they're very interested in renewable energy projects right now. So linking together, as Santiago said, some Japanese companies like Mitsubishi, Subitomo, um, Kawasaki Heavy Industries, those kind of companies together with the potential for them to come in and actually build some of your infrastructure 
can have the Japanese government finance it. Oh, and JBEC has already signed memorandum of understanding to this effect with uh, Washington State and California. Thanks. Uh, I think the reason that we'd like to involve representatives of those kinds of organizations and companies is pretty obvious, but just to state it that um, it's as we get further out away from the current thinking around, you know, hydrocarbons and burning hydrocarbons, which produces GHGs uh, into this kind of thing, it becomes less believable for average folks. It seems almost like imagination. And, and to make it more real, we, if we involve representatives of the, the uh, organizations and companies that are actually doing it, so people can meet each other and realize that that you know what we're talking about here is net zero gas production in BC, and then that gas production eventually can feed into processes like you've been describing, Robbie. So they never produce uh, uh, a net positive GHG. In fact, they might be part of uh, uh, negative emissions, which is where we're trying to go with this whole project. Um, so anyway, thank you so much, uh, Rob, for putting the effort into pulling all that together. Um, Rob already inspired us with this um, not too many weeks ago. And if you look at the draft illustration, you'll see that uh, we managed to get the illustrator to integrate pyrolysis into the production uh, scheme in 2050. Um, We've even got a little dump truck there full of black carbon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might be hauling rubber tires out of there or something. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that's you gotta you gotta be able to imagine it first, and then you have yeah. to make it go. Um, so thank you very much, Rob, and others who contributed uh, to the discussion. Why don't we take? A short break, and then we have, then we're going to talk about the nature-based solutions. And those of you who are